All right. I just want to read verse 22, Revelation 3, verse 22. <clears throat> he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. <clears throat> now, of course, we all have ears. I mean, it says, he that hath an ear. So even Van Gogh can, can respond to this. Uh, he that hath an ear to hear. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> even if you just have one ear. Um, you can hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. However, that's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about physical ears. It's talking about if you have the ability to tune in to the th the heart of the Lord in this matter, um, then let him hear. And if you don't, then, you know, I think in the book of Revelation, it's kind of obvious that if we don't have an ear to hear, you know, you read the book of Revelation and you kind of, you kind of go, I don't know if I really get this. You want to know where the problem is? The problem is when we read like the gospel of John and we say, well, I get this. You know what I mean? We think we, we think we know. And that's not a good thing because we really, really need the Holy Spirit to teach us. And not just to teach us, more than to teach us, to feed us, <clears throat> to feed us on Christ. And, you know, I've often s said that, <clears throat> um, you know, I, way, way back when, way back when Arnold Schwarzenegger had won the, you know, the, uh, yeah, Mr. Universe, you know. I think some other planets have something to say about that, but nonetheless, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> Mr., uh, you know, I don't know how to get that big, you know. <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> I'm sure it was kind of a step down when he became just the governor of a state, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but uh, uh, even when he was at his most strength and whatever, <clears throat> I told somebody, maybe it, was even, maybe it was even you guys, I said, you know, I can beat him up. And they said, no, you can't. I said, yeah, I can beat him up. I said, be real easy. I said, just don't feed him for a week and he'll be, you know, get real weak and, and just walk up and pound the fool out of him, you know. And, um, well, that's a cute little story, but the truth is, spiritually, if we're not eating on, of the Word, if we're not seeking the Lord, and I know, you know, this class right here is, is uh, required for certain students, but most of the people that are in this class, including Sky people, they're not here uh, to fulfill some obligation of uh, requirements. You're here for one reason. You're here because you love Jesus. You're here because you love feeding on Jesus. <clears throat> and that's not due to me. That's due to creating an environment of the word whereby the Holy Spirit can move. And um, um, <clears throat> sometimes the teacher will say something that sparks something. But the, the and, and Skype, you know, the people that are on Skype, uh, um, and those, you know, Alana and Geraldine or whatever, I mean, it's an outrageous hour right now in Ireland. And yet, <clears throat> you know, they're just hungry for Jesus. And, and that is our common denominator. I mean, <laughs> we don't have a common denomination. <laughs> we have a common denominator. And it's Jesus and it's our love and our hunger uh, for, for the Lord to know him and to have him formed in us and to be changed into his image and to within ourselves say, you know, we want to keep feeding or we're going to get weak and then get beat up by the enemy. So, so there's, you know, it's not religion to us. I don't think it's religion to any of us that are here. And it's not religion to me. My searching uh, for the Lord and uh, therefore my sharing is not due to class requirements. I, d I, I am constantly searching in the word, crying out to know the Lord. So, um, so that when I come to class, I, I've got something more than just a good teaching, you know. It, 
I want to be, um, I want to share out of the reality of life that I'm getting and not just talk about stuff. Anyway, we're on the last leg of the very first leg <laughs> of the book of Revelation. And um, <clears throat> what, what we're going to do is sort of uh, close out one section and then maybe the next class, uh, Lord willing, move into another section. Um, but, but these sections go together and they are two different reasons why Jesus is writing this letter or through John and through his messengers, why he has purposed to speak up to the seven churches, which as we've already studied represents the whole church. Um, seven being the number of completion, seven days, and then it was all over with. And, um, and so uh, there is this situation, or, you know, the book itself begins to describe, and we've read a lot of scriptures leading up to this uh, ninth class here. Uh, we've read a lot of scripture, and what we've discovered is the people of God are being persecuted by the beast. Uh, this beast is a worldwide um, entity that he controls as it, as it appears. He controls the world. He controls the, the uh, finances. They control so much of this stuff. Well, this was nothing new to the seven churches. They were already facing that with the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was like a big beast. And it was already controlling the commerce and was already controlling everything by the military and was already, and not just in Israel, but the whole world. And so for them, there was something very familiar about the book of Revelation. There was something very, you know, that was ringing true in their heart about this situation because the Roman uh, Empire at that time had already unleashed a, a huge barrage of persecution against the church and was, was killing Christians and was, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, feeding them to the lions and all that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> and to be a Christian during that time was not, you know, to say it in a mild way, was not fun. But it was worse than that. And, and I don't know if you remember some of the scriptures we read pertaining to the Christians in the book of Revelation, but there was a sense of dread that was going on in the book of Revelation in, the, in these images that were being painted and how they were, you know, remember uh, how we read, and, and the beast made war with the saints. And over and over it kept talking about war being made with them. And so here they are, they're, they're persecuted, they're on the run, they're... Um, uh, uh, fearful, uh, the, the, uh, um, <clears throat> the, the, some of the pictures that we read, it was like, well, they escaped, but the beast ended up still living in luxury and still having their way and still getting all the credit and seemingly being the right thing, whereas this small group of Christians seemed like they were, um, uh, well, there was no credibility about them because number one, they were small. Number two, they were persecuted. Number three, they were poor. Number four, they were fighting. Number five, there were problems within the church. Number six, there were problems outside the church coming in and attacking them. <clears throat> so all of this, all this imagery that is being presented to them in the book of Revelation sounds familiar and the Lord Jesus himself has, has initiated his last apostle to write this and to reach these guys um, with a particular message in relationship to number one, what uh, the first reason that I'm talking about here is this, this uh, really um, bad situation that they were living in. And number two, which hopefully we'll get into the next class, which will be a big turn in our sharing, will be the, um, let's see what my wording is here, uh, the Jewish expectation 
concerning the Messiah <clears throat> and how that expectation had to be addressed by the Lord at this juncture because if the Lord didn't break through on a couple of things, it was gonna, the church was heading in a, in a wrong direction and in a bad direction. And so, um, uh, <clears throat> so with this, with the reason number one, with all of this problems and, you know, uh, as we read uh, through the, throughout uh, chapter two and three about these seven churches, um, there was all this uh, pressure and there was all of this, um, uh, these things that were being built up and um, they were being faced with a choice. And that choice was going to either send them in the direction of the Lord or it was going to be a, a, a crossroads that was going to send them away from the Lord. <clears throat> and um, so if you, if you can imagine, they're looking around, and uh, the Romans are living way better than they are. Um, the Jews, which remember now they're not Jews per se, I mean they are by birth, but not by religion. The Jews are still doing pretty good. The persecution of the Roman Empire isn't towards the Jews, it's towards Christians. And the persecution of the Jew, uh, by the Jews, we always think of, when we think of Jews, just historically I'm talking about now, we think of the Jews being persecuted, amen? Well, in this situation, the Jews are doing the persecution. From the very beginning, folks, they are persecuting the Christians. Okay, now, <clears throat> let me make, let me, make a dividing point so that we can see that clearly. They are not persecuting Christianity as we know it. It's not Jews, for example, in this day and age, if a bunch of Jews rose up and started a persecution against the Christians, it wouldn't be the same thing as what they were experiencing. <clears throat> what they were experiencing back then was that every one of the initial beginning Christians were Jews. They all were Jews, basically, you know. But I mean, basically they all were Jews. Okay, so that means their family was Jewish and they came to the Lord. So these Jews that are persecuting them, along with the Roman Empire, these Jews that are persecuting them aren't people who just don't like, uh, as it were, the Christian religion, so I'll persecute them. And you know, let's persecute the Hindus too. Or It wasn't like that. They're persecuting their own who turn from what they believe to be the truth. Now that's a big deal when everyone that you're close to, everyone you knew, everyone you were raised with that you, you know, played with as kids and everything and all the older people that you looked up to, when they all think that we are all right and you, you don't, you don't have as many people as we do and you are all wrong. Okay, that, all this is working in their psyche. These guys are really starting to go through it because it's starting to look bad all around them. Okay. And so with, with that, that quote unquote, it seems, it seems to be going bad, is um, not just the actual problems they're facing, but how you deal with it on the inside. How do you deal with hurt when um, you have uh, joined with something and people don't believe that it's the right thing or they think it's, you know, <laughs> it's a cult or they think it's, which, you know, that's basically, I don't know if that was the term ever used, but that was the basic thing that the Jews thought of these different family members that were separating out to this thing. And, <clears throat> and so there was the hurt and then there was the, uh, um, uh, the, the, 
you know, always having to deal with people saying stuff or doing stuff or thinking stuff or, you know. Um, and, and so these things are starting to work, work on the seven churches. These things are starting to work on this little, remember there was, I wish I could find it real quick, that, the, that my initial reading of this was that they were um, small and, let's see if I can find it, I bet I can't, but, um, well, you know what, I'm going to read something I read probably the very first class here. Um, John, uh, I mean, it'll all make sense now, this part. John writes to him, and his first words to them are, John, you're, John, a servant and a brother in tribulation. Okay, so he's identifying with them, and he's letting them know, look, I'm going through the same junk. Okay. So there has to be an answer, but he's writing as if he heard, and he has, he's writing as if he's heard from the Lord an answer for this kind of stuff, you know, for what they're going through and everything. And, um, uh, I, I, you know, I wasn't planning on doing this, but uh, the book begins with a series of messages from Jesus to seven churches from the specific information given in Jesus' messages to each church, we might surmise that these Christians were beset with problems and discouraged. And I, again, there was somewhere in here, well, right here. One would think that by that amount of time, the worldwide church would have been walking in victory and showing forth the glory of our Lord's resurrection. Instead, the people of God were small in number, in a weakened state, and the condition of things in their lives had reached a tipping point where all seemed virtually out of control due to per Roman persecution and due to kicked out of the synagogue, kicked out of your family. I don't know if you're familiar with how, <laughs> I'm not gonna categorize all Jews in that way, but uh, some Jews deal with it when you do something that they don't like if you're, if you're their child. You're dead to me! <laughs> you know, it's like, and that's a, that's a real thing. I mean, that, you know, it's, that's it. You're, you're dead to me. And, you know, they don't, they don't turn. Um, here they are. Uh, and again, it's one thing when the world power is on the prowl trying to find out if you're a Christian and then to take you and, to, you know, bring you to the Colosseum and feed you to the lions. That's one thing. It's another thing when everybody that you knew and loved looks at you weird now because of your affiliation. All right. So um, one of the things that this book begins to present is the beasts. And, and, uh, and it presents the beasts uh, in a powerful way and in a controlling way, and in a way that um, seems unhindered. There's nobody, doesn't seem to be anybody higher that can deal with the beast. Not only that, but everybody is assuming the vast masses are assuming that, the, that well, the beasts, and you know, the, 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 that which is in power uh, is correct because they're in power. And who are these dumb little outcasts to say anything? You know, if you want to know where the problem is, it's these little outcasts. And so, um, appearances, appearances are starting to affect them. And actual persecution and rejection by their families, by their quote unquote church, you know, brothers and sisters by, you know, um, their culture is starting to reject them and they are starting to get to a point where they could be influenced by, if I may use this term, the wisdom of this world. 
in a desire to break with all of the, you know, rejection and down and, uh, you know, been a long time since, you know, I've had anything, you know, I mean, <laughs> You know, I, I'm just I'm just listening to him now. Well, I remember back when we were in the synagogue, we would sing and do you know, Allah, you know, and do the circle and jump, king, jumping around and all this kind of stuff, and everybody's and well, I gotta be careful. Um, and and uh, uh, and now. It's like, I mean, think about these seven churches, what we just read. They dwell where Satan dwells. They're, they're, Satan's seed is among them. All this kind of stuff. It's like, it's been a long time since I've had fun. <laughs> you know, you remember Israel when they were in Egypt and then they came out and then all the junk started happening once they got in the wilderness. Remember, one thing after another. No water, then they got sick of manna. Well, then they wanted food, then they got manna, and then they got sick of manna. And then on and on and on. And so what was their conclusion? Let's go back to Egypt. Let's go back. And what did they say? In Egypt, we had plenty of leeks and garlic and food and security and, you know, and there was security in, in being in bondage to the Egyptians because they knew what time they were going to get up and they knew what time they were going to go to bed. You know what I mean? It's like, well, with this, with this stuff, we don't know what's going on. The Romans could come busting through the door at any minute. You see what I mean? I mean, it just put everything on a tenuous basis. And, uh, and so the Lord knows this. And the Lord knows that with these beasts, and so he starts painting this picture in the book of Revelation. With these beasts, he's starting to paint a picture of that which looks secure, of that which has some say. It's good to have some say, amen? Has some say, has some influence, is respected for their opinion, is... Um, not always dealing with issues. Um, I could, you know, I could ha even have a little fun in the process or something like that. <clears throat> and in their heart, they are moving unknowingly, clearly from, from the writings of the Lord here, moving away from the wisdom of God and moving to a position of the wisdom of this world. Okay? So, that's the, that's the basis of, uh, of this first reason why this was written. Now, let me just, I'm probably going to recover some of this, but let me read uh, a little bit here so we can, I can make sure I'm covering everything. Um, persecution. In reality, such was already the case for most of the world of that day, which were under the dominion of the Roman Empire. And the other thing you have to realize is that it wasn't just the Jews that were under the, the rule, the hard rule of the Roman Empire. It was the whole world. All right. Now, now the imagery painted in the book of Revelation is that this is happening to the whole world. Right? It's not just a localized thing happening to the Jews. This is happening to the whole world. And that the cauldron is including the Christians. And yes, the beast, the beasts, and the beasts, the beasts are making war with the saints. But the whole world is, is in this flux and in this problem and, and under the control. And you got to receive this mark and uh, or you're not going to be able to that did, that went to anybody you see what i mean so again the early christians in this group by this amount of time by this amount of time they're kind of going you know this all sounds familiar this this feels you know it's like for us that imagery is like this is bizarre for these guys, it's like, I see, I see something here. I see something. 
<clears throat> All right, for the Christians, oppression and persecution were doubled because of the opposition from the Jews. These were some of the issues that believers were facing when the Lord gave these messages. Um, when the brothers and sisters within the seven churches read Jesus' letters, they were faced with a choice. Because these letters um, were trying to, to awaken their ear to something of God before, the, before it gets to a place where they have made their choice. Uh, so they're faced with a, church, with, a, with a choice of the way of the beast or the way of the lamb. To get ahead, to have influence, to get ahead. Don't, anybody want to get ahead? <laughs> to have influence, um, uh, control, to wield power, the beast seeks to intimidate and dominate. Okay, this is... This is the wisdom of the world is to intimidate and to dominate and if, excuse my way if it's offensive to you but but these this young this young church is kind of on the butt end of, of everything at this stage and they it's not it's it's not fun you can tell it's not fun Okay. And because of that, new things coming to them through beasts, new prospects, um, is opening them up to maybe making a change. Okay, so um, this is the fundamental method used by beasts. But the system used by the beast, and, and here's an important statement. When I wrote it, I, I, was, I was thinking of our present day, and particularly, you know, the most popular shows on TV right now are what's called reality TV. Uh, maybe that's their right, or maybe that's their reality, but nonetheless. Um, and, and so listen to this statement. But the system used by the beast or beasts also promotes selfishness, promotes the system of the beast, promotes selfishness by bestowing honor, respect, and reward on the self-exalting behavior of those who walk over the top of others in order to get their way. Does that sound like you know, the, the most popular reality TV shows are those where, and you, you, and you watch show after show, it doesn't matter what it is, if it's this one or that one or that one, they always seem to pick somebody that'll run over the top of everybody. You ever notice that? Somebody that'll, that exalts them, say, well, and they'll just say, you know, I'll do anything to get in my way. And, you know, I don't care who I step on. And, you know, so-and-so, they're stupid if they're going to, you know, and you hear all this stuff. And, and so, and they almost, they almost um, conceive the game in such a way or whatever, game or whatever, uh, in such a way that to, to come out on top, to win, you have to what? You have to be that way. You you have to. Um, and you can bet that the producers of the show will steer away from idiots that won't do that because they want a competition. But you can call it a competition, but it's a dog eat dog, you know. And so, um, but but I felt like the wording here was important that. Um, the system used by the beast promotes selfishness. It is, pro it is working to draw the selfishness out of you. And it, and it was working to draw the selfishness out of the seven churches too. It promotes selfishness by bestowing honor. Well, man, that's, these guys are perfect bait. You see that? Because they don't have honor. 
they're, they, all they know is rejection and hatred and being spit on and uh, this, but this will promote selfishness by bestowing honor and respect and reward on self-exalting behavior. If you exalt yourself, if you, you know, can you see the beast going, now if you'll exalt yourself, if you'll stand up for your right, if you'll throw off the shackles of, of all of this hard, you know, ridiculous, stupid, lacking way that the seven churches are living and just step out there, guess what? You know, I will bestow honor and respect upon you and reward, I'll reward you for selfish behavior, okay? Well, this was like a carrot being dangled in front of him. In fact, I might even say something like that in this. Um, and then I wrote, Paul describes this as the wisdom of this age. And just so you'll, you know, most of you know these scriptures, but it's 1 Corinthians 1, 19 through 21, 1 Corinthians 2, 4 through 6, and 1 Corinthians 3, 18 through 20. Okay. So Jesus' concern and John's concern is for these seven churches because they are possibly being drawn away to use the wisdom of this world to begin to, you know, break, break the bondage. <laughs> Not knowing that there is no greater bondage than selfishness because it will control you. It will drive you. And in fact, we see, we think we're, we're, um, you know, we think we're free moral agents and we're different, you know, and, you know, we think we're un un unique, you know, well, you are unique just like everybody else. <laughs> but in another way, you're not unique at all. Everybody wants to be happy. Everybody wants to be comfortable. Everybody wants their way in certain things. That's the old nature. That's, you know, and all the beast has to do is dangle the right stuff and we're sucked in unless, unless, unless I can see the Lord trying to reach out to these seven churches. I can see John with the burden of the Lord coming through him trying to reach out to the churches and saying, you know, um, like, uh, <clears throat> who was it, Sardis? You have a name, but you are dead saying, get out of, you know, that's not real. You're just saying stuff. You're just, you got a, you've got the name of it, but no reality of it. And, and the Lord is warning them. And he's saying, he that hath an ear to hear, hear. You have to break out of this, the, 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 the religion of it, or you're going to eventually be sucked into the um, uh, beastliness of it. Susceptibility to that system. Because if that's what is our, if, that, if we eventually give up and give in to that spirit, of course, it won't be an instantaneous thing. It's a gradual thing that is, you know, knocking and saying, well, but yeah, but what about this or whatever and everything. And all of that stuff is slowly working on a person so that he'll eventually stand up for his rights. I'm not going to re-preach 1 Corinthians. But Paul's whole thing, I mean, I didn't even, I didn't even get into, um, you know, some of the parts of what Paul gave up his rights for. But he did it because it was Christ in him. That's what he said. That's what he declared. Christ crucified. It's what I preach. It's what I live. It's what I love. All right. Well, I don't blame people for not loving it. If, 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 if they haven't, if the cross hasn't crushed uh, in, rea in the revelation of it, if it hasn't seen the crushing of the old nature and of the old life and everything, you know, just like e uh, Israel, they get out in the wilderness and then they think, well, let's return. 
Well, just like in the book of Hebrews, uh, what does it say? That uh, had they been mindful of that country from which they came, they might have had opportunity to return. Mindful, you put your mindful of it and you will return. You know what I mean? I mean, you, you know, you get your mind full of that, you, you know. Uh, and of course, you know, the book of Hebrews is all about sacrifice and all about those, those things that represent, that are, that they don't just represent, they are Christ. They're fulfilled by the very person and nature of Christ and will only be fulfilled by the person and nature of Christ in us or it won't happen. It won't happen. It won't happen if it's not Christ, you know, Paul didn't say, well, I pray that you get Christ. It was the church, Galatians. It was the Galatian church. He said, I pray Christ is formed in you. You've already got Christ. You can't be the church without Christ. Can I get amen? <laughs> but clearly, there is a travail on the part of John for these seven churches. Clearly, there was a travail on the part of Paul for the churches of Galatia, which was not one city, but a wide area that had many churches, just like John. And he's praying. He didn't say, I pray that you'll, you'll be religious and that you will learn to pray and you'll read your Bible and you'll go to church and well, be sure and give tithes or whatever, you know, give money and, you know, this and that. God, you know, you know, Baptists are doing that, so are monks, <laughs> you know. I mean, in Hindus, they're praying and, you know, reading the Koran and going to the temple. What's the difference? Well, we believe this, so we follow this. Well, we believe this, so we follow this. Well, I don't, it's not, it's not about believing this or that. It's about believing Christ in such a manner that you you have believed the cross, you have believed the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and therefore you have come to a conclusion, this is what I am and this is what I love. This um, spirit of selflessness, um, this spirit of, of losing the gain, I, nobody's talking me into this. Well, I can, I can tell you nobody's talking me into it, you know. I mean, I, you know, you say, yeah, but you're the leader, and that's why you, you promote this so much, because it's your thing. It ain't my thing. It was God's thing, and Paul saw it, and it became Paul's thing only because, because when he saw it, he saw that he was crucified, and he said it. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, Christ liveth in me. So he said, I don't have any choice. I mean, I do, but I, I make my decision to, to not make a decision for me. Not my will, but thine be done. I make a decision to not make a decision for me. Not my will, but thine be done. And so, so um, you know, uh, and I said this uh, a year ago or so, but I said, you know, I said to the church, I think it was on a Sunday morning, I said, you don't think I, I couldn't come up with a means of promoting the church and getting a lot of warm bodies in here and doing all this? I mean, I'm, you know, I'm really not an idiot. I could just come up with all sorts of programs and hotsy totsy things, man, you know, and uh, music and, you know, we got great musicians here and, and we could really promote ourselves and we could really, you know, just, you know, to, to really get popular though, we're going to have to, you know, we're going to have to dump a few things, okay? We're going to have to, you know, dump Mike Wallace and, and then we're going to have to dump <laughs> Just teasing. And we're going to have to dump the cross. Oh, we're going to have to dump the cross. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and we're going to have to, you know, uh, we're gonna, I mean, we, we can't be talking about Christ in you all the time because people get freaked out. And you certainly can't be talking about that you're dead with Christ. Okay, well then, you know, I remember when I was, I mean, I wasn't even a year old in the Lord. And I had an old Bible. I was out witnessing and went down to Lee Park and you know and I was standing there talking to this guy and you know I said da 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 and this this guy was 
you know, supposedly a Christian, he said, well, that's, that's not even true anymore. He said, that ended with the apostles. I was talking about, you know, faith and healing and miracles and all that. He said, well, that's not true. That's not, that's, that's gone, you know. That ended with the apostles. I said, really? That ain't true anymore? He said, yeah. I reached in there and ripped that page out. So, well, tell me what else ain't true in here? And he just went, <laughs> you know, he's a Baptist, so he's really freaked out. Oh, my God, you know. I said, I bet there's all kind of stuff ain't true in here. Let's just start ripping it out. Let's go for it. You know, and he just kind of went, you know, and said, I've got to get out of here. <laughs> and people have been saying that ever since. <laughs> but my point of doing that was, oh, so there's a bunch of this. Well, let's just rip it all out. I mean, really, come on. Let's, you know, but, I, but, <clears throat> but there is not reality TV, but reality in Christ that is worth living. But you gotta, you gotta embrace it. You know, had they been mindful, they might have had opportunity retu to return. Um, but my mind is full of Christ because my mind is full of the, the Word of God and because I don't pick and choose what scriptures. I mean, I remember sharing a couple of years ago too about, you know, I, I, well, I shared it, but I remember when I saw it, I was reading um, in the uh, Gospel of John and Jesus said, um, Jesus said, my doctrine is not my own. And uh, I remember, you know, you know how this goes. You read something a million times and you go, yeah, you know, yeah, Amen. whatever, let's move on. You know, show me something good, you know, and you don't really see anything. But that particular day I went, oh, my God, he's saying, because he's talking about going to the cross and all that. And he says, I'm, you know, my doctrine is not my own. And I thought, you know, this isn't my doctrine either. I, nothing in me, selfish Randy, would have ever chosen this teaching. In fact, I was on the fast lane to being Kenneth Copeland's assistant. And there was money, I mean, still is, money and success and fame and all this stuff, man. I was right there before he even made it big. I would have been there riding the wave. I knew all of his sermons. I could preach them, some of them better than he could. <laughs> they were his sermons, but I memorized them. <laughs> and, you know, I, I wouldn't have chose this. Nobody would choose this unless the Lord got hold of them. And unless they were sincere enough to go, you know what, that's what it says. If it says that I'm crucified with Christ, if it says that, you know, to die is gain, then I'm with the Lord on this. And I'm gonna be with the Lord, not because it's my doctrine. It's not my doctrine. It's his, and I choose his doctrine. I'm with the Lord. And I don't care what, you know, I don't care what the whole world thinks. And, you know, and I say that, you know, you do understand that I do care and get hurt feelings. You, you do know that. Okay. And you do know that everything isn't a bed of roses all the time, don't you? And you do know that sometimes I actually slip into, this doesn't happen very often, but deep depression, you know, uh, over different major things that have happened that have broke my heart. Broke my heart, literally. But what are you going to do? I mean, it's not my doctrine. <laughs> you know, it's not like, a, oh, I think I'm going to change now. You know? Well, that was, that was fun for a while. Not very long. But, you know, but but now I'm going to go the fun route, you know. No, no, I'm not. No, I'm with you, Lord. I love you, Lord. But you see, you have to see the Lord, not just hear his teachings. You have to see what is the Lord and what is the Lord to be in you. Well, that's, you know, I, I understand these seven churches. I, you know, and John does too. That's the thing. John wrote him and he, he started off and he says, you know, 
John, a servant. <laughs> he sounds like Paul, who sounds like Jesus, who sounds like, you know, it's just this um, uh, uh, ongoing thing. I had uh, Mike Gentry over today and, and uh, really loved that brother. Y'all know I've known that guy since I was 16, right? We, we've been friends for a lot of years and we love the Lord and everything. Um, and I just said, Mike, I need you to do me a favor. And he said, what's that? I said, I just need you to pray for me. You know, I, um, you know, physically for the junk that's been hitting me. <clears throat> um, I'll, you know, I'll even hit you with a few. <laughs> I've had this certain lamp fixture up in my office for a long time. I've got a regular strip that you would see, but there's another one that I've had up there for a long time. Very old looking one, very, you know, nondescript though. You probably wouldn't notice it if you've been up there a hundred times. <clears throat> I'm sitting there just a few days ago and it falls and I mean it knocked a fool out of me. <laughs> I just got a lump and was bleeding and all this stuff, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course this thing that I'm messing with, this physical thing, and uh, I'm just going to tell them the other night, you know, the other night I was laying there in bed. At, I don't know, what time was it, two or three in the morning? And uh, I'm laying on my stomach, and this has only happened one other time in my life, but I uh, got uh, acid reflux real bad and while I'm asleep. And it shot up, hit the back of my throat, locked my throat up. I jumped up. I guess I just ran into the living room because there was a light on then, ran in there and was fighting and struggling to breathe. And it was so locked up that I was, you know, I, I couldn't breathe. And I was just barely, you know, it's like, you know, I was just barely getting a little bit of air in each time and was just going, I am not going to make it. It's, I mean, genuinely, it was, you know, it was getting close. And... And then all of a sudden, you know, it started opening up. And <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's like, it's like drowning because you're, you're doing everything. That <sighs> and, and just nothing would go in. And I, I had it happen one other time. Um, well, the end result of that was that little run re-injured all of this again. I was, just, I was starting to do a little better. I got up and played guitar last week, remember? I was fun. I was going... <gasps> I might actually be a human again, you know. And, uh, uh, and, you know, just set it back again. You can feel it and just go, oh, my God, you know. So anyway, I said, Mike, I just, <laughs> would you pray for me? I mean, it really, this is starting to look like, you know, maybe the enemy wants to kill me. You know, I mean, that's what it's, what it's starting to feel like, you know. I mean, he was there the week before, and I, you know, I was thinking, well, maybe this is the Lord. Well, after this week, it's like, maybe the enemy just wants to kill me because some of this stuff's getting pretty bizarre, you know. And, um, you know, Mike is so funny because he can be real spiritual, religious, you know, sometimes, you know. I mean, and it's good. It's not necessarily, but it's very official, man of God-ish. Um, but we've been together for so long that, he just, and he loves me, and all he wants is the Lord. He, he wants something to happen in the Lord. So he's just so humble and sweet, you know, and he's just, Lord, just help my friend, <laughs> you know. But he prayed something that was just really precious. He prayed, I need to quit here in a second. He prayed that scripture, um, <clears throat> Psalm, uh, Isaiah 40, I think it is, and I think it's the last couple of verses there. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And uh, he said, uh, he said, this is your servant and he waits upon you. And so I ask you to renew his strength. And I just saw that all of us who really are his servants, I mean, we wait, we're like waiters, we wait on the Lord. We, we hear, I mean, you know, we hear what he I mean, if we hear his heart, we want to be there. You know what I mean? And, and, and we hear when he asks for something, and we want to be there. We're waiting on the Lord. And we do, we've been doing that, some of us, for a long, long, long time, you know? 
And uh, when you do, when you when you're a waiter, when you're a servant, when you're doing all this stuff for someone, you get tired, don't you? I mean, just because I mean, just, you just because you are doing for someone else, you're not tired of doing it. You just physically start. You know, all of us, you know, do that. And and he said, they that. But I, but I saw, and he said, they that wait upon the Lord, not wait and don't do anything. I've always read that, they that wait and don't ever do anything, then you'll renew your strength. Well, folks, if you just wait and don't do anything, you'll naturally renew your strength. You know what I mean? If you just, if you, <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't need no spiritual thing happening to you then. You're just going to renew it because you're sitting around doing nothing, waiting. <laughs> So that really doesn't make sense, but he's but but the way that that Mike worded it when he prayed for me, they that wait upon the Lord, they're the ones he's going to renew your strength. It's going to be a renewing of strength. It's going to be, and it's going to be a renewing of strength for what? To keep keep on waiting on the Lord, to be there with the Lord, to keep loving the Lord, to keep serving the Lord. And when I say serving the Lord, I mean. Fi Finding the things that move his heart, finding the things that touch him, finding the things that are precious to him, and being about those things for him and to him. That's what I'm talking about. And I thought, you know, that's just beautiful. They that wait upon the Lord, they're the ones that are going to renew their strength. They're the ones he's going to empower to be able to keep doing this because they're not about themselves. They're about him. Anyway, well, let's stop and we'll take a break and we'll come back in a few minutes.